So now, welcome to the last, uh, today's last talk here in Janson on, uh, by Drew Mosley on Mende. So, yeah, welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, I guess the microphone is working. Very good, very good. All right, so uh, my name is Drew Mosley. Uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about Mender. I've talked to a lot of you today, uh, so hopefully this will be review. If I did my job right out at the, the booth, uh, you know, I, I, I was answering questions properly for you, but uh, hopefully we'll get a little bit deeper here and uh, give you a little bit more information. Uh, we've about made it to the end of the day, which is good. That means there's no speaker after me to get annoyed if I speak too long. Downside is everybody looking at me will probably be annoyed if I speak too long because I'm certainly in the way of dinner, drinks, or something much more interesting. So I'll try to, to keep on time, and I'm sure the folks in the uh, orange t-shirts will do their best to make sure that I do so. So uh, just a brief overview, uh, things we're going to be talking about, uh, some challenges and motivations that led us to uh, develop Mender as a project, uh, specifically focusing on the, the unique needs of the embedded marketplace. Um, then we're going to kind of dig, dig into some of the requirements that we put together, some non-functional requirements, as well as some uh, installer strategies uh, specifically related to the functioning of uh, the update client that we've developed. Um, and finally, we'll dig into Mender specifically, address some of the, uh, how we implemented certain things based on the requirements that we outline in, in uh, bullet point number two here. Uh, if the demo gods are on my side, I'll be able to at least demo a, a small portion of this system uh, and so that you'll get a better idea of uh, what the workflow is like when, when using the Mender system. Then we'll uh, go into a little bit more technical detail of some of the device requirements and things needed to actually integrate Mender into your embedded device. Uh, briefly talk, uh, mention uh, some of the testing and the, the general community uh, general community open source type of, uh, of things that we have involved in the project. So briefly about me, I've been in the embedded Linux and Yocto development space for about 10 years now uh, and uh, longer than I'd like to admit in uh, general embedded. Uh, my current role is I am the, the project lead and uh, uh, technical solutions architect for, for the Mender product uh, focused on customer facing solutions and that kind of thing. Um, you see some of the details of Mender over here, but we're going to dig into those, so we'll just move right on past that. Uh, real quick sales job, we are hiring uh, for uh, some of the positions you see here on the screen, uh, and we do have a table out uh, over that way somewhere, so if uh, this looks of interest to you, feel free to stop by and talk to us tomorrow or catch us uh, on our way out this evening. So briefly, I just want to kind of motivate why OTA is needed. I suspect the majority of the folks in this room don't need a whole lot of convincing, but uh, there's a couple examples on this slide of things that have happened in the, specifically in the IoT space uh, that were a result of either non-existent or poorly implemented update technologies. Uh, there were some smart locks that were used uh, as part of uh, certain uh, home sharing sites uh, to allow owners to remotely open and close their house when their uh, guests were arriving. And at some point, they tried to push out an update. However, they pushed the, the wrong update, and it was for a different version of hardware, and it resulted in these, these uh, expensive door locks being completely bricked and unable to let people in or out of the, the homes until somebody physically went on site and was able to, to uh, actually update the devices by hand. Uh, there's been a lot of talk in the automotive space of, of head units uh, running the infotainment systems that get caught in a reboot loop uh, due to poor, poorly implemented updates. Uh, and one that I'm sure we've all heard about is the botnets that are out there. Uh, I think the, the biggest one that uh, kind of made the headlines uh, was Mirai. This was a couple years ago now. Uh, some claim it peaked at about 600,000 infections. I've seen uh, reports as high as a uh, million and a half, and I'm sure... Uh, the, the more recent numbers are even higher. Uh, it, did, it was used to issue, uh, exhibit a uh, DDoS uh, against major internet sites uh, in, in late 2016, taking down many uh, large internet brands that uh, I'm sure we all use day to day. Uh, and the, the intent of that really, uh, as far as uh, we know the, at this point, was uh, profit. Uh, the folks that were eventually caught in, uh, uh, and prosecuted for this were, my understanding was they were running Minecraft servers and they wanted to be able to take their competitors offline. So they, they, they developed this uh, botnet to be able to, to, to actually 
uh, attack their, their competitors in that space. Another one that came out shortly after that that was uh, uh, called Brickerbot, the author claimed 10, 000, uh, 10 million infections, although that, uh, that number seems a bit, uh, a bit high to me, but uh, uh, it certainly did hit some, uh, a, a large, number, uh, large number of devices. Uh, the, the, the assumed author uh, officially, quote, retired in uh, November of 2016. The intent of this was what has been termed a permanent denial of service. So once a device was uh, added to this botnet, basically all the block storage devices were overwritten with random data to ensure that the device could no longer function at all and was taken offline. And, and the author's claimed intent was to uh, address uh, devices that were on the network and uh, potentially vulnerable, causing, uh, causing uh, havoc in the internet eco ecosystem. And so the point was uh, very much like chemo chemotherapy, like kill, you know, destroying the devices to save the rest of the system. Uh, and there are new, newer uh, botnets that come out every day that get even more sophisticated. The, the early botnets were very much uh, around uh, uh, leaked credentials and things like that, but the newer ones are using, uh, using more insidious me mechanisms of getting access to the, to, the, to the system. So this is an ongoing problem. So uh, a couple characteristics of the embedded environment that uh, makes it uh, a little bit uh, unique compared to, uh, say, server-side programming uh, or web-based programming. Typically, the devices are remote. Uh, it, it could be pretty expensive to send a technician on site to, uh, to, to take the magic USB key and install an update. So, uh, you know, so you want some means of accessing devices and doing the, the, remotes, uh, the, the updates remotely. Um, product lifetimes are, they vary widely in the embedded space. Some, some markets uh, are as long as five to ten years if you're in the automotive space. If you're in the consumer electronics space, it could be, you know, six to twelve months. So there's a, quite, a, quite a variety there. Typically, they're in a very hostile deployment environment, uh, typically outside of your control. Think about uh, uh, the Wi-Fi routers and things that are in, in your local coffee shop. They're not, uh, not exactly in a controlled environment. Uh, power issues have to be dealt with. Uh, a lot of these devices are running on power, on battery power, uh, and even if they're not, there's no guarantee the owner of the device won't reach over and yank the power cord out of the wall at any given moment. So you've got to be able to uh, uh, handle power unsafe characteristics in your update system. And finally, the network typically is going to be uh, a little bit uh, different than your, than your typical uh, data center. Uh, the connectivity might be intermittent. You might be over a 3G or a 4G connection or something even slower than that. Uh, and, and you may or may not have, a, may or may not have secure uh, connectivity if you're going through public networks. So what are some of the requirements that, that, that we laid out when we were designing Mender in the first place? One, robustness and security, kind of vague terms, but specifically in terms of updating capabilities, we wanted to make sure that rollback was supported. We, are, we always have the ability to roll back to a known good configuration. This is to avoid brick devices in the field. We wanted to be able to have signed and trusted images, uh, standard industry best practices as far as cryptographic signatures and things like that. And we wanted the ability to, to have integrity checks of the images to make sure that the, uh, you, know, you didn't have... Uh, a download failure or you didn't have a man in the middle inje trying to inject a bad image, and then compatibility checks, and this is specifically to address issues uh, that were mentioned uh, in a previous slide related to the smart locks. You want to make sure that the image you're installing is specifically for the device you're installing it on. Uh, another requirement is atomic updates. This is very important when you're talking with large, when you're talking about large device fleets. If I, if you have, are attempting to install an update and it could crash halfway through and you get a update that's half installed and you have a device fleet of a million devices, that means you've got a lot of different possibilities of what the actual software is that's installed on your device. So ideally, no component in the system will be aware of a partial update except for the, the update client itself. So if there is a failure in the update, the update client detects that and makes sure that none of the rest of the system is available or is impacted by it. Obviously, we want to be able to support uh, updating everything that's, that, that we can in the, in the target system image. So kernel apps, libraries, uh, device trees, that kind of thing. 
Um, there has been some discussion of updating bootloaders, uh, and the only way to do that robustly would be to uh, set up some kind of multi-stage bootload. Uh, because there has to be some piece of code that is immutable in the board to avoid any windows for uh, getting brick devices. It needs to integrate well with the existing environments. So most of, most of these designs come to, come to Mender, they are already pretty far along, whether they're using uh, Yocto or they're using Debian, that kind of thing. We wanted a system that integrated well with the existing environments and their existing workflows, making it easy to get started. And bandwidth consumption obviously is a concern. Uh, many of these devices are on uh, lower speed networks, so we wanted to make sure that uh, compression, where, where, where it made sense, we use that. Uh, we will be implementing delta differential updates here soon, so uh, that, that should make things even better along the bandwidth, uh, bandwidth lines. And finally, uh, the downtime during the update, we wanted to minimize that. Uh, so we, we're all familiar with, uh, you know, your phone coming up saying there's an update. Uh, do you want to install it? And you say yes, and three hours later you're waiting to get your phone back. So we wanted to, to find ways to minimize that. So given those uh, list of requirements, we wanted to talk, we, we started looking at the, the various uh, mechanisms and, and strategies for actually installing new, new or updated software on a device. So the first one we looked at is called in place. Now this is very much uh, like what you're used to today in your, in your typical desktop uh, Linux operating system. So this would be something like an apt get update, uh, that kind of thing. So the, the updater itself runs in the user space and updates part of its own user space. So that's a fairly common uh, mechanism that we're all used to. Um, the next, next strategy we looked at is maintenance mode, and that's uh, very similar to the one that I mentioned uh, with your Android phones or your iPhones, uh, where it actually boots into a separate mode and from there installs the update. Uh, the downside, the main downside of this is fairly, uh, fairly large downtimes for your device, um, and plus there's a, a, an issue of redundancy in the bootloader and the, the update client. Uh, and then the third installer strategy that we looked at was the dual, dual root file system approach. And this is a, a fairly common uh, approach in the embedded space where you're actually using two fully redundant root file systems, uh, each of which contains the kernel, the, any of the init, init RAM FSs, anything that's needed to bring the system up, uh, anything at, at, at a higher level than the bootloader. Note that in this case, again, the bootloader is uh, a single bootloader. There's no redundancy at that level. And finally, we have proxy updates, and this is uh, something uh, that we're getting ready to uh, support uh, in, a, in a more gen general fashion. The idea is that uh, a lot of these designs these days are more than just a single system. Uh, they might, uh, they, they consist of, uh, you know, they might have a gateway and then a whole host of, uh, you know, home automation things, uh, maybe smart lighting, that kind of thing. Uh, and those devices themselves may not have enough, fun enough capabilities on board to handle uh, redundant root file system updates and that kind of thing. But the gateway uh, is able to actually run the update client and uh, proxy the updates over to the, to, to the device. So that's a, that's a, a another uh, mechanism that we're looking at uh, supporting here in the very near future. So, kind of to, 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 to dig in a little bit, uh, of course, we did choose uh, the image-based updates as the first mechanism for, for updating uh, that we wanted to, to support in Mender. Uh, so why did we do that? As mentioned, uh, this will, in general, increase the robustness of your fleet. So the idea is all the, the software that is installed on your device is exactly what was tested in your CI environment. We know that. There's no ability for... Uh, packages to be updated uh, one by one on the device in the field. So if I do a full image update, I know, that it, I know that what is on your device in the field is exactly what was tested in my environment. It does reduce your testing matrix. Obviously, if I only have one image at a time that is known good, I only have to test that image. If I open up the, the software stack so that the devices in the field can then apply package-based updates on there, I've got to, in theory, test every possible combination. And ease of rollback, this is another big one. We have full redundancy in the root file system so that when we boot into an update, if there's an issue with that update, we can simply, on the next boot, uh, the, the bootloader can simply instruct the system to roll back to the previous known good configuration. And this, this has a couple of advantages uh, from the update uh, system perspective. One is that we know we can always connect to the server and install another update. We never, uh, if the, the update client is unable to connect to the server for any reason, that's considered a failed update and we will roll back to the previous known good configuration. 
And atomic updates, I mentioned that previously, but that's a, a, a pretty important uh, component. That means your code doesn't need to know anything about the fact that there's an update process going on. There might be some integration uh, at, at some levels if you're moving forward to new versions of database, database schemas and things like that, uh, but that's typically handled at the, at the boundaries of an update, uh, either right after the update is, insta is installed or right after the uh, system has rebooted into the new update. So uh, the fact that the, the, uh, the update system is completely atomic means that your, your code runs, doesn't even need to know an update is going on until it's ready to actually uh, move forward into the next state and, and reboot into the new update. And uh, finally, the, the deployments are reproducible. If I, if I have a, a set of devices in the field uh, and I'm trying to for instance, I'm trying to deploy uh, uh, update version 3. Um, I, all my devices are on uh, version 2, and 80% of my devices, they succeed, they're, they're, off running ha they're off running happily, but the other 20%, there was some issue, maybe the, they had a, uh, a power issue or some other issue with the deployment, so they rolled back into version 2. Now I have 80% on 3, 20% on 2. I can simply issue another deployment uh, to version 3, uh, and all the devices that are on version 3 will simply ignore the deployment because they're already there, and the devices that failed the first time around will get another, get another shot at updating to that uh, version. And at that point, uh, you will have completely reproduced the previous deployment without uh, in in interrupting any existing devices that are running on the new version. And just uh, to kind of drive the point home a bit, uh, some of the challenges with package-based updates, uh, and this is, uh, you know, for, the primary reason we chose to avoid package updates, at least as our first supported methodology, uh, really comes down to the total number of combinations that, that, that come out of any kind of package-based update. Uh, a lot of the package systems, I know they're getting better about handling uh, atomic updates and rollbacks, but uh, it, it, there's, no, there's no installation order uh, that's enforced by the package system. So if I, if I update one set of packages on, on this device over here and this device over here for whatever reason deci decides to start with a different set of packages, uh, it's very possible that my devices, my devices, even though we think they're running the same version, the, they might be slightly different. So the dependencies between them uh, and then the fact that if there is an issue that stops a package-based update, uh, the, the means to clean it up is not, not always obvious what needs to be done, and that can, that, that can cause issues with further installations down the line uh, and, and block installs of, of new updates that may be out there. So this is an open source conference. I probably don't need to, to do a whole lot of selling on the, the open source side of things, but uh, a couple, couple of things to point out. Uh, our, our biggest... A uh, competitor is uh, those that want to, to build their own update system. Uh, we talked to a lot of uh, embedded uh, IoT developers, and many of them thought, oh, it's an update system. Okay, I'll just write a couple shell scripts. It shouldn't be hard. I'll just uh, deploy uh, a disk image uh, over HTTP. I'll write it to the, the block device, and I'll be done. It, you know, and con conceptually, that's what needs to be done. But it gets much more complicated when you, when you start looking in the details and the, and the way things can go wrong. Um, and, you know, and how much time and effort are you spending if you are designing your own update system? How much time and effort over the lifetime of your product are you spending maintaining the update system versus maintaining your value add and your specific use case and your expertise? So, uh, you know, th th that was part of the reason we wanted to, to release this as a separate product and an open source product is so that it could get out there and become a de facto standard in, in the community and, and, and help answer this, this problem that, that, that everyone in the uh, embedded space deals with uh, and find one solution for this that could be reused across many different designs. So let's talk a little bit about uh, what components uh, need to go into any, uh, in, in, in any embedded update system. So uh, the first upper left, uh, obviously you need some means to detect the update. In our system, we have a, a server and a client. The client just opens a, a connection over TSL and uh, at, a, at a specified polling interval asks the server, is there an update available to me? That's pretty, pretty standard. Uh, compatibility check. Uh, it's environment specific. Some would say optional, uh, but given the risks of not doing it, I would say uh, that, it, that, that it really should be promoted to a must have. Uh, download, obviously that one's pretty straightforward. TLS, just download the, the data blob. Uh, and then a, a number of checks from there, integrity check with uh, uh, checksum. This is, of course, to detect uh, just download failures. 
uh, and, and that kind of thing. Authentication, obviously, this is, uh, gives you a little bit uh, greater guarantees, and this also decouples your infrastructure from your actual development system. So the act, the uh, certificate, the signature is applied in your CI system or by your developers and so that gives you uh, guarantees that are independent of the security of the transport layer. And then from there moving into things like uh, decrypting uh, if it's important that your payload is encrypted, uh, extracting if you are using uh, compression which I would imagine everybody is. And then at that point we can do things like pre-install actions. So this is going to be very dependent on your application uh, and your, your device and what is, what is necessary. Uh, do you need to uh, flush databases? Do you need to, to shut anything down? Uh, that, th those kind of things might be necessary depending on your exact uh, application. And from here, obviously the installation, uh, th and you know, in our case it's uh, simply doing a block based write to uh, uh, the, the inactive partition. Um, and then we uh, move into the, 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 the post install actions and these are the kind of things that would happen before the reboot if there are any that are appropriate for your, your device. And then uh, we do a reboot and then we come back up and we do post install and sanity checks. So uh, as I mentioned the Mender client itself, just the fact that the Mender client is running as an application is a, a pretty good sanity check that the kernel's up and running and then if the Mender client is able to actually make uh, contact with the server we know that the, the network functionality is, is still there. And then uh, you as the system designer will plug in sanity checks that are appropriate for your environment. And then once, uh, once all those checks have completed, then we can commit the update and, and move forward. If any of those checks fail for any reason, then there, ideally there will be some mechanism for doing rollback and failure recovery. Um, and, and so that's, that's where we, we get the best benefit out of having the, the fully redundant root file systems is in that final step. So uh, a little bit of high level about Mender specifically. Uh, we have both the, the client and the server. Uh, it is written in Golang. It's all open source under the Apache 2 license. Uh, all our sources are up on GitHub. Uh, and we also distribute all the server side components as uh, Docker containers and a Docker Compose environment that will allow you to spin up your own version of the Mender server on any, any system that's uh, capable of launching Docker containers. Uh, the client itself is, is written in Golang as well. Uh, it's fully, fully open source, both the, the, the server as well as the, the, the web UI and the client that runs on the target. Uh, and all the tooling, uh, QA, everything that is available uh, through GitHub and, and through our, our, our docs website uh, that you see there. And there's a lot of information in the docs website that will talk you through the APIs, the architecture of the server, the architecture of the, the, the client, what's needed to integrate it into your design and that kind of thing. Um, so moving forward, uh, a little bit more detail uh, on Mender, AB image update, TLS communications, all things I mentioned. Uh, one thing to mention, because we have two root file system partitions, this gives us the capability of allowing the Mender client to install an update, stream it directly to the inactive partition, uh, and that, that reduces the amount of storage space that's needed uh, in the active partition because the, the, the new image is never, uh, is never stored persistently on that partition so it just goes directly to the, to the inactive partition. Uh, and then uh, the, the other things uh, that, that, that I mentioned, deployment management, obviously that's through the server, uh, cryptographic signing and verification, uh, standard industry best practices there. Um, and then we have uh, a what I call what we call the a state script mechanism, and this is a, effectively the the means with which the system designers can customize the mender the mender flow to their particular use case. So at every interesting state change within the mender client, you can plug in uh, a, a script that it, that is expected to run to either allow or or reject the particular state change. So for instance, if you have a, a, a dodgy Wi-Fi connection. Uh, you might have a, a state script plugged in at pre-download to, to check the strength of your Wi-Fi or the strength of your battery to either allow the download or reject it or to allow it to be tried again later when you have maybe, uh, when the device is maybe plugged into a, a, a more reliable connection. Uh, and and uh, post-install uh, sanity checks and things are implemented with the same mechanism. So there's about nine or ten different state changes where the system designers are able to plug in their own uh, customization scripts to be able to, to, to control the flow of, of the, the states through the Mender updater uh, workflow. 
So th this is kind of an image uh, going into a bit more detail uh, on the AB uh, dual root file system approach. So on the left hand side we got our bootloader. This is the, the immutable piece of code uh, that uh, has to be programmed in, uh, you know, at, at, in the factory or on your, on your desk. Uh, typically it's uBoot or Grub uh, and then uh, one of our recent changes we've actually started running Grub on top of uBoot. Uh, in, in the ARM environment, this allows uh, us to actually use both uBoot and Grub unmodified, and, and we are able to implement the logic we need as scripts on top of Grub. So it makes it much easier to get that integrated into your environment. But in a running system, you have uh, the image, in this case, the green image, image A, it's active. Uh, that's a full root file system, uh, contains the, obviously the vendor client, uh, the, the full Linux environment, kernel, DTBs, kernel modules, libraries, everything. Uh, and then we've got the image B partition, and, and at this point, uh, this one's inactive. And the contents of this partition at this point should be considered uh, unknown because there could have been a, a, an update deployment started that failed for some reason. So uh, some, some, some people ask, well, you know, can I two weeks later decide I want to roll back to that previous version? And, and that's not something we support simply because there's no way to know if anything has happened on that partition since that's all uh, information within the vendor client and it's not something that, that we choose to expose. And additionally, one, one piece I did not mention previously is this uh, blue partition here. That's the data partition. Uh, that's where all the persistent data needs to go. Mender, uh, at runtime during uh, updates, we don't touch the data partition. So this is where you would configure things like Wi-Fi credentials and things like that that, are gonna, that you're going to want to persist acro across the various updates. So once we have uh, the system updated here, we actually just switch the roles. Now image B is active, image A is inactive. Uh, and, and the first time we boot into image B in this case is, is considered a conditional boot. Uh, and it, it, if for any reason this system reboots, we simply jump back here. Uh, the, the, the logic in the bootloader will, set, will, will know that that, Im, that update had not been committed and it will automatically switch us back to image A. If, the, if in the, the failed image the system was up far enough that the mender client application code could actually, is actually running and can detect a failure, we will automatically trigger the reboot if it's for, uh, if, if your deployment for instance has a, a bad kernel uh, and you get a kernel crash before the vendor client can get up and running, obviously uh, we can't trigger the reboot at that point uh, and you'll be relying on watchdog timers or other uh, standard mechanisms to, to uh, force the system to reboot. But even in that case, we would not have committed the update yet, so uh, when that watchdog, fire, watchdog timer fired and uh, rebooted your system, it would simply move back uh, to, the, uh, to, to the known good configuration. So n move, moving on a little bit, we'll talk about the Mender server. This, is kinda, this slide is kind of an eye chart. Uh, for those that are used to uh, microservices architectures, you're probably used to, to, to big, uh, uh, lots of boxes on the screen like this. Um, the only exposed ports on the server are port 443 and port 9000. Obviously 443 is the TLS port that uh, the client communicates over and port 9000 is the, uh, the, storage, uh, the, the storage port. So when you're actually downloading the actual artifact itself, that comes across port 9000. Uh, and, it, you know, the, the, the APIs between all those, the microservices are, are exposed over, over um, over a RESTful API so that you can make calls into them. Uh, we do have the web UI, but uh, many, many users that already have a device management infrastructure, they will actually plug the, the Mender server into their device management infrastructure using the API rather than, uh, rather than using our web UI. So you can trigger deployments, you can uh, group app, you can group devices and that kind of thing all over the API. Uh, and all the, all the components in green are stateless, which means they scale very well horizontally. So if you have a very large device fleet and uh, for, for your particular use case, say you're in, it's your inventory subsystem that uh, is your bottleneck, well, you can just add more uh, containers. You can just scale that uh, the containers uh, uh, running the inventory service, just add more of those, and, and uh, that should help alleviate the bottleneck. Obviously, the persistent storage uh, databases uh, and that kind of thing, th those can become the bottleneck and there are, are uh, very uh, uh, best practices for, for scaling databases and, uh, you know, if you get to the point where that's the case, then, then presumably you have database experts who can uh, guide you in, in, in implementing sharding and things like that. 
Um, the, the link down here on the, on the lower left uh, of the screen is uh, our API docs, uh, and, and that'll kind of give you an idea of some of the, the functionality that's available uh, and provided by our, uh, by our server side uh, microservices. So a little bit about what's needed on the client side when you're actually uh, integrating into a new device. Uh, typically there's, uh, obviously there's the, the A and the B root file system uh, partitions and the data partition. We mentioned those already. Sometimes there's a boot, uh, a bootloader partition. It depends on exactly how it's implemented on your device, whether it's actually a separate partition for that or uh, if the bootloader is just stored in a separate uh, SPI flash or some other device. So that's going to, that's going to depend very, uh, uh, very closely on the, the design and architecture of your hardware. Uh, the bootloader integration, as mentioned, uh, is what controls the boot process. So depending on which bootloader you're actually using, whether it's U-Boot, Grub, or uh, Grub on top of U-Boot, uh, in U-Boot we just use standard U-Boot scripts, and Grub has a scripting API that, that, that we've implemented this logic in, and this is the logic that determines whether to boot the A or the B partition, uh, and, and that's typically the, the main communication point in the Mender system between the Mender client and the bootloader. Um, as, as far as actually implementing the uh, bootloader integration, that tends to be the, 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 the most uh, development heavy activity when, you're, when, when you are integrating Mender into your build. So if you're using U-Boot, uh, if you're using, or, sorry, if you're using Grub or you're using Grub on top of U-Boot, that's pretty much automatic. Uh, it doesn't require any source code modification of either U-Boot or Grub, which is great because uh, that's where it gets uh, problematic. We also have some auto, automatic patching of U-Boot, uh, where if the, the, the U-Boot feature, or the U-Boot functionality for your board follows, cert, follows uh, uh, some of the newer uh, functionality within U-Boot and, and is implemented similar to other boards, we're actually able to detect and patch the right files automatically. If for your particular platform, uh, you know, maybe you're on an older platform that hasn't been updated with uh, all, all of the U-Boot uh, uh, the, the U-Boot features that have been added recently, uh, we can always fall back to a manual patching, and we have that documented very well. You know what exactly needs to be done. Uh, you know what functionality needs to be added to the to the to the U-Boot. So is, integrating the bootloader is likely uh, w where you're going to spend most of your time, but we've done everything we can to make that as easy as possible. Um, the runtime integration is, we, our requirements on the actual runtime are, are fairly minimal. Uh, it's a, a sim fairly simple application, about uh, 8 to 10 megabytes in size, uh, that, uh, that runs as a daemon in, in the Linux runtime. Uh, we support uh, EMMC and SD card uh, with uh, typically EXT4, EXT3 type uh, file systems. And we also support raw flash with uh, UBI. And then as far as the target OS's, uh, Yocto and Open Embedded is our primary out-of-the-box supported platform. Uh, we have a standard Yocto metal layer uh, that you can integrate into your build, set a few configuration parameters in your local.conf file, uh, and then you, you can pretty much get uh, Mender integrated in your device uh, without too much, too much hassle that way. We've done some work with BuildRoot and, and OpenWRT in both cases. Uh, some of that has been submitted upstream and is, is able to be reused. Some of that's going to require uh, some, some customization if you decide you want to use one of those systems. Uh, but uh, we, we have done that through our services group uh, on a few occasions, so we know that it is possible to support them both. Uh, and finally, uh, recently we, we released a, a, a utility we call Mender Convert. And this allows us to support uh, things like Debian, Ubuntu, Raspbian, uh, things that are fairly common in the uh, embedded IoT space, um, but uh, typically have their own package-based updaters and that kind of thing uh, involved, uh, associated with them. And the way this works is the, the Mender Convert utility is actually a post-processing post step uh, that will work on your, um, once you have a Debian image or an Ubuntu image with all the packages and all your code and everything, and you, you have your golden image that, you, that, that works for you, then you, you post-process that image, and we actually will loop back mount the, the file system image, image, we'll inject the Mender 
client and, and all the configuration files and create the multiple partition structures and the artifact uh, based on that image that is needed to be deployed over the air. So it's, it, it's an extra step to do it this way uh, and we are certainly looking at uh, getting better integration with the build systems for these, uh, for these kind of operating systems. But pretty much any system, any other, any other target operating system can be supported with this mechanism. So if you have something that's not listed here, uh, you know, feel free to reach out or, you know, jump on our mailing list or whatever, and I'm sure we, we'd uh, be happy to, to, to work with you on getting uh, additional operating systems supported. And what's, what's coming soon? This is the, the big thing that a lot of people have been asking about and we've been talking about quite a bit over at our, at our desk. We've got this new framework called Update Modules coming uh, probably two to three months time frame. And what this allows us to do uh, is to uh, support updating microcontroller sensors and other small devices. So the idea here would the, the idea here would be for these devices to be updated in the proxy mode that we talked about before. So your embedded Linux uh, system would function as the gateway running the Mender client and then we can write uh, uh, plugins that would allow you to say update an Arduino that uh, I is connected to your device or some kind of sensor that's connected over to LoRa or some other, some other kind of small device. The, the, the client in this case will, be, will not be running on the device that's being updated, it'll actually be running on the gateway device. Uh, with this, with the update modules, we will be able to support, we will, we will be able to better support in place updates such as running app get update and that kind of thing. There will likely be some limitations there. Uh, it's unclear if we'll support kernel updates because typically the distribution provided kernel uh, model is a bit different than what Mender's expecting. Uh, so there may be uh, some extra steps involved if we want to support uh, updating the kernel uh, through this in place update mechanism. We can also support uh, simpler things such as just uh, s configuration and calibration data. If you, you know, if you just want to update a few files in slash Etsy uh, and don't want to download a full root file system to do that, uh, this, this framework will, uh, will allow us to do that. Container based updates, uh, this is uh, something that a lot of folks ask about. Uh, we, today we don't directly support this, uh, but with this, uh, with the update modules, uh, we should be able to, to support running uh, various container subsystems on your, on your devices and, and, and providing the updates to the containers from there. Uh, differential or delta updates, this is a very uh, common request, uh, especially when you're dealing with uh, large root file system images uh, and with, when the only minor things change in between them, you don't want to re-download all the things that are already there. So uh, we should be able to provide better support for that. And as mentioned, this is a framework. So the idea is this is a, a, allows us to create the common ones that we know people are going to want, but then uh, this can also be used uh, for very specific use cases. Uh, if you have uh, so, some subset of devices on a board uh, th that you want to implement something very custom to update Linux on, you know, two of your cores and then you have uh, maybe some uh, RTOSs running Zephyr or free RTOS or something like that on, on, uh, on other cores uh, in a very uh, custom mechanism uh, to, to update all those, uh, those systems together. All of that should be possible with this update module framework. So, uh, real quick, uh, if you want to get started with Mender, these three commands uh, are, are all you need to do. Uh, if the demo gods are on my side, I'll actually be able to do this and at least show the web UI here. Uh, the link down at the bottom uh, on our docs page will walk you through this. Uh, and this, uh, th this basically downloads a Docker Compose environment and actually launches the Mender server uh, on whatever machine you're running on, as well as it launches a, a, a Kimu-based uh, emulated device already uh, running the Mender client and able to connect to your server. So, Let's see how well we're going to work here. Uh, are those, those fonts are no good. Is that reasonable? All right, so. No. Oh. Password. There we go. Okay, so this, and I'm just going to let this scroll. So this is actually launching the Mender demo environment here, uh, which, uh, as mentioned, was a is a Docker Compose environment. So we're, we're launching a, a number of Docker containers here, and in a moment we'll start to see all the logs from each of the containers uh, go scrolling by. At this point, we can actually go ahead and make sure I've got the uh, user set up for me to be able to log in. 
And now we can see the logs from the emulated device that's, that, that's running here. And just for good measure, I'll go ahead and SSH into this device. So, so this is obviously an x86-64 QAMU device. And so I can actually display the Mender logs here. And at the same time I can jump over here. So this is the, the Mender web UI. Now in our case, you can't really see that very well. Um, we have one device here, which is our emulated device. Uh, it's running uh, version 1.7. We have an artifact, which is a, a version of software to install. And we can trigger a deployment here. We'll select the artifact. And in this case, I'm just going to select all devices. Uh, it does the compatibility check here. You see the device types is uh, QAMU x86-64. And we trigger our deployment. Now this is where I am fairly certain that it's going to fail. But if we look over here, we can actually see that it attempted an installation. Uh, and here we get an update install failed uh, due to the uh, image sizes are not right. So we have a bug in our environment right now. but. Uh, uh, the, the bandwidth wasn't su sufficient for me to, to, to do a full build from scratch today. So uh, after a few minutes, this will be detected as failed, and this, uh, the, this uh, particular deployment will be uh, marked as, uh, as failed due to that. But that should at least give you an idea of uh, you know, what the workflow is like when you're working with a Mender, Mender system. And just to share a bit more here, we do have a, a, a Google group slash mailing list uh, that, that, uh, that, that, that's out there. Uh, pretty standard uh, open source type uh, working model. We love contributions. Uh, if you have any ideas, feel free to jump on our mailing list. Jump on hub.mender.io. That's our uh, community site. We're actually migrating all of our mailing list to there. This is a, a site to share uh, tutorials, uh, integrations, if you've added it to a specific board that somebody else might uh, benefit from, uh, we'd love to have you uh, post that there. And obviously we have an IRC. Uh, and then developer portal, uh, the very bottom link there is, uh, is pretty much the, the, the main link to get all of this information. And with that, I think we've got some time for some questions. Hello, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is, do you have any plans uh, to support updating devices that have encrypted storages? What I'm thinking about, especially, usually when you want to protect uh, disseminated devices against tampering, what you would do is encrypt the storage, use a TPM, and so on. And so if you update the software, you have to inform the TPM, and that can be very tricky. Is it a challenge you've already looked at? Uh, certainly, we want to support uh, TPM and things like that, and we do have uh, some, some, some one-off uh, services work that we're doing towards that. Exactly how that's going to, to roll out into generic product uh, type things, we, it's unclear. Uh, but uh, there's nothing inherent in the Mender architecture that would preclude us from that, but uh, there's obviously uh, extra work that needs to be done to implement it. So, and it, you know, if you have ideas, uh, again, feel free, free, feel free to reach out. Uh, we, we, we'd love to have more people contributing there. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, how does this system deal with the uh, trust zone? You know, uh, many. Um, in the China market, many of them just use the Android way, which can handle the trust zone, but it's not real. The, uh, AB, the, A, the AB method mixed with the bootloader and the trust zone was very important in, in a, an OTA. Those producers need the OTA, the question one. 
Uh, okay, I'm not, I'm not following the question. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, how does this system deal with the trust zone? With the trust zone, you cannot address the flash the image into the uh, into the B part or A part. Gotcha. You have some key problem, and there, there are some security problem here. Have you ever think about it? Right, so, so the answer is we don't deal with that today. <laughs> uh, may I ask the second question? Oh, okay, how do you show something like you refer as a Wi-Fi password in the data? You do, as you just use the image update, not a package update. Some, uh, some conference files so would be updated in the other, in the other version, which the original file right. share between the date. The data partition page is not us usable anymore, and Correct. that would cause some more problem here. Right, so, so, so basically for things like configuration files uh, that, uh, that for, for Wi-Fi credentials, for instance, you know, they're typically stored in Etsy, uh, in the Etsy directory, and obviously that's overwritten with a, an image-based update. So it's really up to the system designer at that point to arrange for those files to be stored in the slash data partition and either replaced with a sim link in slash Etsy or uh, just, you know, change the configuration file so that it knows to look for the credentials file over in the slash data partition. So that's definitely a system integrator uh, step. It's not something we can do in any kind of automated fashion. But I think uh, the overwrite over way is much better with a script for that. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and scripting it can, can, certainly, can, can certainly help there. Uh, I think we got a question up here. Hello. Hi. Thank you. Um, I was wondering... It seems from the entire system that you have everything there to potentially support recoverability. So, for instance, if your current, if you're running on A, and you do something silly, then is it possible to, over time, create snapshots to B to say at some point, oh, I've messed up my A. Can I just switch on to B instead? That's certainly something that could be added. It's not something we. we it's not a model that we support today. Right, so the, the expectation is that your active partition is known good and then your passive partition is completely undefined. So, so, so the idea, you know, of, of having multiple, multiple snapshots and that kind of thing is not, you know, we, we have two. That's all we have today, but uh, conceptually it certainly could be expanded as such. Hi, thank you for your presentation. How hard would it be to deploy Mender of an existing uh, MQTT network? I, I'm sorry, I can barely hear you. <laughs> uh, would it be possible to deploy Mender of an existing uh, MQTT network? Implement Mender. Let me, let me come a little closer. <laughs> oh, implement M Mender over MQTT. Uh, it, it, as long as you've got a, a pipe for data, we, we, could, we could potentially do that. Today we, we download the images and, and, and all the communication is over TLS, but as long as there's some data pipe uh, available, we could certainly do that. MQTT might be a little heavyweight on uh, you know, full image updates. Uh, it might, be, might, might stretch the MQTT protocol a little bit too much, but sure, that, that, that conceptually could be done. Easily? Uh, I'm not going to promise that. <laughs> Um, a lot of these devices often have uh, limited uh, onboard storage, and maybe they don't even have a separate data de uh, storage device or partition. And sacrificing half of your existing storage in the name of reliability and reduced downtime during an update might be a little excessive. Have you considered uh, alternative systems like using a minimal, uh, a minimal partition with the base system and uh, your Mender client running just to perform an update and then return to that partition? Uh, so you're, you're talking about, uh, wh where was it? Something like, uh, where'd it go? Something, so, something like the maintenance mode where you, you, you have a, a smaller, up, uh, an update client uh, that, that, that'll update a part of the system and then you boot back into that and then you kind of bootstrap on top of that? Yeah, except instead of having to do it in the bootloader, you can still have a, a, a root FS. Uh, and actually that picks up on the previous question, which was about uh, using the separate partition to recover functionality. Ooh. So instead of having that functionality embedded in the bootloader, which, as you mentioned, has some problems, uh, it could be a separate uh, rootfs partition. Yeah, it's not, again, it's not something that we've put a whole lot of thought into uh, in terms of specifics of how to implement it. 
uh, that update framework uh, that, that I mentioned at the very end potentially could be used for that, but we'd obviously have to dig into the specific requirements to see how well that, that would match up. Okay. Um, we're running out of time. Yes. <laughs> Although it's the last talk, thank you very much for Thank your you talk. so much.